The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Wisconsin. He came to Madison as a 42-year-old with no college head coaching experience, with the expectation of turning around a football program that was at best a perennial doormat in the Big Ten. Almost 20 years later, he pilots an athletic department with a budget that's approaching $100 million. And we'll meet this guy next on Wisconsin Reflections. Coal country. He grew up in the gritty coal country, western Pennsylvania, played linebacker for a very tough Nebraska team, honed his coaching craft under such legends as Lou Holtz and Hayden Fry, and eventually became the only Big Ten coach ever to win back-to-back -back Rose Bowl titles. Somewhere Woody and Bo may not be smiling. And uh, here's how he came to town. Here's how he came to Madison. You can't put a team on the field. We can't build a great program here overnight. You can't do it with mirrors. You can't do it with tricks. We're going to build it from the foundation. We're going to do it the hard way. Don't know how long it'll take. They better get season tickets right now because before long, they probably won't be able to. Well, that was prescient. Barry, thanks for coming to the show. Great, Always great good to be with you. Thanks, John. Great. Um, <laughs> what was the tipping point when you realized that maybe you could pull it off here? Well, you know, I think two different times against Ohio State. Actually, as early as our second year, playing at Columbus, uh, they beat us soundly. They were a very good team, and uh, uh, late in the game, and we were a young team, but late in the game, the, most, the majority of the players on the field were true freshmen. Oh. They were not intimidated. They scored. They moved the ball, and we hadn't moved the ball for a year and a half. Mm-hmm. But we, we moved the ball. Uh, they played hard. They played competitive. Uh, they showed that they can compete at that level as 18-year-old kids. The first people to believe that one of the most remarkable turnarounds in college athletic program history, uh, the first to believe that it could happen had to be those players. Uh, well before the fans kind of got the idea, um, how did you convince those young student athletes that something different could happen in Madison than it happened for the last several decades? Well, that, that's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's nothing about what you say. Mm -hmm. it, it's how you go about your business, how you command, what you command of your players, uh, what your staff does. The staff, has, I had to first of all have a plan to, uh, that was sound uh, to win. My, my staff had to buy into that plan and then sell it to the groups. I could talk. To, I, I would talk to the team uh, as a group, but my staff was in charge of each individual position group, and they had to continually relay the message. But what we what we demanded every day uh, in teaching a group how to win uh, is a 24/7 proposition. Right. And and it's about how you live your life, uh, having accountability and responsibility. Uh, and after a while, you start doing things the right way, it translates onto the field. So it's a lot of little things in, instead of a lot of big things. Exactly. That philosophy of all those little things and how to get them right. Um, Hayden Fry, the biggest influence. Lou Holtz, the biggest influence. And how much of it was that you, what you saw them do and you wanted to do differently? Those two plus Bob Devaney. Okay, sure, right. It was a combination yeah. of all three. Three Hall of Fame coaches, all very in influential in, in, in uh, developing my philosophy uh, and what I did was try to take what I believed of each one everyone was a little different in their own ways in some cases a lot different totally different philosophies on, on many things um, so I came up with with, with the idea there are a lot of different ways to get the job done right there's not just one way to get it done but it better be what I believe in I can't be Lou Holtz or, or, or Hayden Fry or Devaney, but I could be myself <clears throat> and sell what I believed in and make sure that in Wisconsin with the type of kids we, we could recruit. Large kids. Big guys. Big large yeah, kids. Not a lot of speed. No. You know, I'll grant you as that. I, as I said, <laughs> our, the heart and soul comes from, well, you know, the, the heart and soul will come from the, from the state. Yeah. The hands and feet from elsewhere. Right, yeah. For, for the most part. Yeah. So 
Um, and that was a great strategy, smart. Well, that's that's what we can recruit here. Right. We could get physical guys, tough guys, and big guys. Right. And so that, hence the run, the rushing game and building it on good defense fundamentals, rushing the football, field position football, which I was brought up with. Sure. How did you convince recruits that you could be competitive? Because it had to be tough to com uh, to recruit to this program in the first three years. Well, you 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 sell what you have. Right. You know, I just come from Notre Dame, and there you sold. Uh, playing for a national championship, playing on TV every week, and the exposure you're going to get. Uh, you, when you come to Wisconsin, you know, we, we took a, a look around, and it's easy to s find out all the reasons why you couldn't be successful. And all the years uh, of lack of success, we sat down as a staff, and, I, and I, I challenged the coaches. I said, give me reasons why we can win. Why would you want to come here? Give me the positives. And we sat and we listed. You talk about the community. Great community, great place to live, world-class university academically. You talk about, uh, you know, social life for an 18-year-old coming into college sure. is somewhat important. State Street, not yeah, a bad, yeah, not a bad things, play. Those, those things are important. That's yeah. a positive. Um, we talked about our staff, and we talked about having the opportunity to play right away. You know, if you, you go, you know, the easy thing to do is go to a program that's won and gone to bowl games. You know, be an individual have the opportunity to come and help turn a program around. You know, I was on the tail end of that at Nebraska when they flipped that program yep. around. People always remember those teams. Yep. You could be the one that made a difference. And as a young player, if you like to play, and every good player wants to be on the field, yep. you can play here sooner. And you're not going to play right away in the big programs. That's exactly right. At the time. Right. So that's what we sold. Did you surprise yourself? No. I, I felt. I, you know, I respect you for that. No. You, got, you got a little swagger, and you have to have a little swagger. You better believe in yourself or you have no <laughs> chance. Now, there were times that, um, and, and understand as a head football coach, just like a leader in anything else, you can't show a sign of weakness. Weakness. My, my turn is, term is you never flinch. Right. You know, even the, and I just come from Notre Dame. We had just won, I think, 25 of 26 games. We had a long winning streak, and. You know, and, and at Iowa, we had gone to six or seven straight bowl games. You know, I thought I had all the answers, but I, I forgot the players are the ones that have to play. Yep. It's not all about coaches. It's about good players executing. And, um, but they could never see. I'd always have to, you know, I couldn't show anyone that I was down. Uh, you have to show your coaches, your mm -hmm. players that. And there were times when, you know, I'd have a staff meeting and I'd tell our guys, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling. And, and that first year was really difficult. Right. But, I'd have to go in and show, be the strength of the program because if I'm in the tank, everyone's in the tank. What, um, you must have strong feelings for that first Rose Bowl team. Um, you know, you talk about the team that turns it around. Um, that was a remarkable thing, not just for the athletic uh, program, but for the Wisconsin community, both the university and the state. Um, did you have a realization of what you'd pulled off at that time? Um, uh, or, or, or was there a little pinch myself moment to it? What you said originally, John, uh, my feeling towards that group of players, they'll always be special because that was a group that we recruited in a three-week span when I took the job. Right. I took the job the day after, officially the day after we had, we had won the Orange Bowl. Um, basically recruiting is, we were about finished at Notre Dame right. with commitments. So you we were playing catch-up. We were Big starting from scratch. Had to put a staff together and then go recruit. Yeah. That group of players, that was the foundation, and the majority of those kids ended up leading us to that first Rose Bowl. So they bought in. Right. And that DNA uh, continued for almost another decade. Uh, as we go to break, um, when did it really hit home that the University of Wisconsin had a football team to be reckoned with? January 1st, 1994, nearly 70,000 Badgers crammed into the Rose Bowl. Otherwise, that day, known as uh, Camp Randall West, to see their team's first appearance in 31 years, and they didn't go home disappointed. Listen to Keith Jackson call the last few moments. Bevel runs away from pressure, got loose. What a green in front of him. It's touchdown. Bevel makes the big play for the Badger. It's over. Cook tried to surprise him, tried to run it up the middle. Didn't have a timeout to save him. Was knocked down. The clock runs out. The Wisconsin Badgers 
have defeated the UCLA Bruins by a score of 21 to 16, and it was a great day for the drummer boy. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Hey, we're back in Madison, Wisconsin with Barry Alvarez. Um, how'd you make your case to Ron Dane? Everyone said when he was a senior in high school, he was going to be a Heisman Trophy winner. They were right. How did you get them and others didn't? Well, recruiting is a process, and it's, it's about relationships. And I had a recruiter on my staff, an assistant, who had been with me for a number of years. We coached together at Iowa, Bernie, Bernie Wyatt. Sure. Bernie had established a relationship with a counselor at Ron's High School. And the, counsel, the, the players used to hang out in his office. And he'd pretty much direct them where to go to school. And if you recruited there, you better get along with this counselor because he was the trigger guy. Sure. And so Bernie had a good relationship. He'd send players to, to, to Iowa when we were there. Uh, and Bernie always looked after all of his players, made sure that they graduated, even if they weren't playing, sure. that they were treated right, they went to school, uh, they walked out of there with degrees. So had a good relationship. We had recruited Lee DeRamus right. and Michael London sure. from the same school. So uh, we had the same relationship. and You had a little rhythm going. We had a little rhythm going there. He told us how to, you know, he, he told me about Ronnie and the type of person he was. And he said, when he comes in, the first thing you need to do, you, you, you need to give him a big hug. <laughs> you need to show him that you're going to be perfect. So he walks in. First time he walked in the office, I came, went over and gave him a big hug, a big bear hug. And to this day, when we greet each sure. other, we do the same thing. But well, he's moved back to town now. He lives in he's town back in now. Madison. Absolutely, now. has a nice family. His, yep. his young kids are yep. very athletic, and yep. uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be heard about. <laughs> oh, us. great! You're already so, working it. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, Ron, Ron was a fullback in high school. Right. He's an All-American fullback, and but I watched him as you watch film. Every once in a while, if he played fullback, he was lined up about that far behind the, the quarterback. They'd hand him the ball. He'd disappear in the line. The line would move. And every once in a while, he'd right. come shooting Pop out, out the other sure. end. Every once in a while, they moved him back about five to six yards off the line of scrimmage at tailback. And they'd hand him the ball a little deeper. And he'd find, find a hole. He'd hit a crease. And then he'd outrun everyone in the secondary. Mm -hmm. I said, he'd, he'd be a great tailback. Which no one else was talking to. No him one that even way. considered right. him a tailback. I told him he, he could play tailback for us and he could carry it as many times as he'd like. <laughs> and he did. And he did. <laughs> I still remember the Purdue game uh, his freshman year and the, the DBs were just afraid to come up on him in the second half. He was just well, in, he, in the zone. He made a name for himself. And, and the stretch you're talking about, and I'm not sure which of those games, he had a three game stretch where he carried the ball 49 times, 51 times, 47 times and rushed for 200 and some yards each game. And he, we, we rode him. And in Hawaii, in the last game of the year, every time we go back to Hawaii, they, the media still thanks me for taking him out of the game. <laughs> he had 325 yards, I think, in the, early in the third quarter. Yeah. They refused to tackle him. Smartest kid you ever coached? Oh, wow. Um, Brooks? Smartest football player. Yeah, just Brooks. Brooks was a coach on the field. Yeah, Daryl was a coach on the field. Yeah. Both came from coaching families. Both understood the game. Daryl is now the offensive coordinator at Minnesota at the, with the Vikings. I, I was with Brooks a couple weeks ago. Brooks will coach in the NFL also. Sure, but they're co they were coaches on the field. Most most physically gifted kid you coached. Here. Yeah. Um. Either Lee Evans or, or um, Chris Chambers. I was going to guess Chambers, too, yeah. Um, funniest kid? Um, Nick Rafko. Nick Rafko, the legendary Nick Rafko. Nick Rafko's <laughs> sister was Miss America. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, Nick, I inherited Nick. Nick was, was a Don Morton recruit. Uh, senior year was the first Rose Bowl. At, at that time, the Rose Bowl had a, a dinner of champions. Mm -hmm. The greatest thing, greatest event than any bowl game had. Introduce every player that year at the Palladium.
came down to a spotlight, sat down in three tiers. Wow. And, and it was a tremendous program. Hollywood. Had entertainment. We had Rafco on stage with, I think, uh, um, I forget, I, I, you would know the talent if I told you. Can't remember the talent that we had singers, comedians, sure. so on. Rafco did a shtick. Really? I mean, he could have been. Tore it up? He did. That's great. He did Bill Murray better than Bill Murray. Beautiful. Um, do you miss those moments with the team? You're an administrator now, but there's nothing like the bond that is created by a team at the beginning of the year through a whole year. It's, it's a private group. Uh, no one can really understand it. You have to miss that. Yeah. That, that's what I miss the most, uh, just the camaraderie and building a team and watching, watching a group come together and watching the different personalities, different parts of the country. You know, I'm in every one of their homes right. during the recruiting process. I know where they come from, but to see guys develop, to see uh, how they all blend together and, and the, the relationships you, you build with, with the athletes and the relationship you had with the staff. And their parents, I would think, absolutely, too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we'll be right back. I want to get your thoughts on how Brett's doing. I want to talk to you a little bit about life as an AD. We'll be right back with Barry Alvarez in Madison. See you. Come back. The University of Wisconsin has been inspired by the Wisconsin idea. Which says the good work of the university extends to the boundaries of the state and beyond. So the UW works hard to help build Wisconsin's economy. Educate people of all ages. Advance health and medicine. And enhance the quality of life for all of us. Hey! The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. Hi, we're back in Madison with Barry Alvarez, uh, 1993 College co Football Coach of the Year. Uh, now AD at UW, and now, you know, you win three Rose Bowls, so you get a statue. Can you roll that little <laughs> piece of, uh, of beautiful sculpture? Thank God we're not showing nails tails. Here you go, Bear. There's Cindy, <laughs> and there's John Wiley. Okay, d had you seen this before they rolled it out? Actually, uh, not the finished product. Did you pose? Did you have to model for it? Yeah, I picked a picture out. Did they, you picked the picture out? And did it? You're laughing very hard at it. <laughs> they mean, asked us. They asked us to <laughs> come to the studio in north suburbs of Chicago, and I, I said, "Come, what's the difference?" <laughs> Cindy said, "It's going to be there a long time. You better make sure they do it right." So we stopped and, and went in and. I looked at it, and I wasn't quite sure that was me. You thought me. it was Doug, Douglas MacArthur, I yeah, think. I wasn't sure that was me. And, Cindy, and, and they said, what do you think? And, I, and Cindy says, that's not him. <laughs> oh, yeah. The guy said, I, I did. She said, all right, she, she's, telling, she's ordering me around like a junior high. Jump up on that stand. So oh. his torso is a little longer than that. She, he's, she's going through the whole deal. Oh, so my. They, we hadn't seen it since... Uh, they made the adjustments. Well, I, I, the thing I like about it, you're too young to have a statue, but to laugh at it when it's rolled out <laughs> is, is a great take. Um, how's Brett doing? I think Brett's doing a good job. I think, uh, you know, you always have growing pains. Um, everybody, that, any, anyone that's, that's ever taking, taken over a job, um, you learn as you go along. Uh, I think, uh, and you have to. Well, I in hazard to guess he learned more this year than the first year. Sure, it's easy. When, it, yeah, when, it's when easy. Everything, what do you learn when everything's year, going great? He's 12-1, and one, did a great job, put a staff together. There were question marks on that team. He put that staff together. Uh, they communicated well with that team. They win 12 games, uh, playing a January 1st bowl game. In the other year would have been a BCS mm -hmm. game. The next year he wins nine, plays in a January 1st bowl game. This is what you, when you learn. You know, it's when, when all's going well. Uh, is very easy for anyone. But when you have adversity, when you have injuries, you lose some tough ball games, uh, people start questioning you, that's when you find out whether you can coach, whether you can hold a team together and keep them focused. How much did you talk to him after the season about the season he had? Well, I mean, what a great asset to have you here, but then you don't want to cast too big a shadow either. It's a fine line, right? I, I try to stay out of his way. That, you know, and I... I but I'm there as a, as a sounding board. Everyone in, this bit, in the coaching business needs a sounding board. Sure. There are things that happen that unless you've been in those shoes, you, you, you can't believe it. And having someone that's lived it, uh, you know, you need to talk to them. Sure. So, you know, I'm always there to, to listen. But 
Uh, one of the advantages I think I have as an athletic director is, is having been a coach, having lived a coach's life, right. made those decisions. So uh, it, it's my job to then evaluate a football season just like I did when I coached. I sit back, I list the positives, I list the, minu yep. the minuses, the things that, I, that concern me, and some solutions. So when, when the season's over, Brett and I sat down. Um, I went through all the things that, that I saw sure. this season, my concerns, uh, the things that I thought were positive. Uh, now it's up to him right. to, it, to see whether he agrees with them or not and then have the solutions. Um, I found myself thinking the day of the Michigan game that for the first two years, it was a, it was a great run, but I thought, I wonder how Barry's doing in the, in the box at Michigan in the second half. I found myself thinking that might have been the first time you had a hard time watching a game since you had retired. Is that a fair well, statement? Well, the, the hardest was the first game. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, you had in, one in from Cleveland. the box with your knee. In Cleveland. You, you well, had... I, I, I stayed in the box, but right. I, I was calling the plays. Right, and yeah. I was, I, was, I was managing the game. But all of a sudden, officials can't hear me. Right. And I'm not making decisions. Yep. Control. And, and I'm lear you know, I learned, I watch a game, I see mistakes. Right. That's what I look for because that's what you have to correct. And so uh, the first game was very hard. Everyone left the box in Cleveland and sat outside and let me vent. Left you all by yeah, yourself. I think I scared Cindy said, ooh, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't be that way in these boxes. You yeah. Know, so. But, you know, the thing that, you know, it always bothers me whether when I watch a team that I'm supporting, one of our teams, yeah. when we make mistakes, when we beat ourselves, that's, that, that always concerns me. Right, yeah. Um, well, when we come back, I want to talk to, uh, talk to you about how, what role Cindy's played. And I want to talk a little bit about PA, a little bit about Pennsylvania and Nebraska. We're in Madison. We're with Barry Alvarez. Stay here. We're back in Madison. Barry Alvarez is with us today. Uh, Bear, so you're uh, a good athlete in Langloth, Pennsylvania, coal country, and Nebraska comes calling. Uh, my question is, if you had been Barry Alvarez, would you have recruited? Barry Alvarez, the coach, would you have recruited Barry Al Alvarez, the player? And if so, why? In 1964, I would have. Yeah. Uh, but the game has changed. If, if I were recruiting today, yeah. no. <laughs> The game has changed. The yeah. game has changed. The game is spread out. Um, you have to play in space. Um, you know, when I played at Nebraska, it was 90, 80%, 90% run, Running. Yep. physical, play between the tackles. I mean, you, could, you have to play in a phone booth. A lot of brute force. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a physical game. Um, and I could, that, then that's what I could play. Did you play uh, three years? I mean, did you play as a sophomore? Yeah. Did you? It's, Freshman ineligible. Right. Played a freshman schedule, and then I played three. Um, what did you learn from Devaney? Bob Devaney was way ahead of his, his, his time. The way he practiced, the way he managed players. So not, not be predictable or be open to new? Well, he had a structure in how he practiced. And back in those days, pl coaches were, you know, if they lost a game on an extra point, they may practice an extra point for an hour. You know, on yeah. Monday, the Devaney's practices stayed the same, made corrections, but it was about teaching. It was the the old Gestalt theory, whole part whole, yep. and and uh, it's just the process through the week and how it's very similar to, to how uh, teams practice today. Right. But that was way ahead, ahead of his of time. His time. Um, you are of Spanish descent. You spoke Spanish before you spoke English. Were you aware of being different when you went to Nebraska? I mean, Pennsylvania, pretty big melting pot. pot. Nebraska, not so much a melting pot. Were you conscious of being uh, one of the few Hispanic players on the team, or did you never have that sense of differ differentness? I, I really didn't. Yeah. Um, you know, where I came from, the, it was every nationality. Right. Um, 
didn't make any difference. Um, you've been voted one of the most influential Hispanics in America. Do you think, you know, there's nothing more diverse on a campus than a football team, if you think about it. Um, do you think the fact that you are of Hispanic descent has helped you relate to all sorts of different players, or do you think it was just the way you learned over time? Because it's, it, it's, it's a big mix of people and cultures. Yeah. You know what? Where I grew up, uh, as you said, was a melting pot. You felt very comfortable with all nationalities, right. all races. Uh, that's what you're accustomed to. Um, so being a team, you looked at it as a family. You didn't look at it as, you know, they're this nationality or this race or whatever. That's, that's the way I always approach it. So to answer your question, yes. I mean, I, I, that made, you know, me being able to relate and have fun right. with nationality. I, right. Tarek Saul and I teased each other, sure. you know, forever about nationalities, you know, yeah. and, um, and, and I tease him about, you know, the Spaniards cut the Arabs off when they got the <laughs> right at, at the boundary of Asturias where my family's from. Sure. We whipped your family. You know, <laughs> sure. we would tease each other and he'd say, oh, no, you're an Arab, you're not Spanish. You know, we, yep. we had fun with that. And, and I love to do that. Yeah. Um, Celebrate the differences a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Cindy, uh, how big a role has she played in helping you chart your career? We got about 15 seconds before I go to, 30 seconds before I go to break. And I know she's three <laughs> segments unto herself, but um, she's been a partner. Yeah. She's been like an assistant coach. She's bought in from the time I she's, was an assistant. She's a strong woman. Absolutely. She, you know, we, I moved from Lincoln, Nebraska, where we went to school. She was teaching, I was teaching to take a, a head coaching job uh, in a little town in the middle of Nebraska. She did cry all the way home, but <laughs> accepted it, and we moved. And anytime there was a move, she was with it, whether it be making cookies or having the entire team to our house to, to, for dinner yep. as a high school coach or a college coach. She was going to do whatever it took for us to be successful. And I say us. Yeah. We won together. Well, she did. Um, we'll find out uh, why you guys chose to be married at Arlington Cemetery, which, you know, is kind of an odd omen for a marriage. But um, we're going to be right back. We're going to take some questions from the audience. And we're in Madison, Wisconsin with Barry Alvarez. Stay with us. Hi, we're back in Madison. Barry Alvarez is the guest today. We're going to take some questions from the crowd. Hi, stand up. What's your name? What's your question? Conrad Antringa. I have some questions about the academics, Coach Alvarez. <clears throat> I have some awareness of the difficulty it is to be a full-time athlete at a major university in a major sport. Your son played hockey here, right? Correct. Both did. Yeah. And I have granddaughters playing soccer for Wisconsin. And I'm lucky enough to have a grandson going to play hockey for Wisconsin coming up next year. But I understand how tough it is to go to school full time and try and meet the schedule that the major sports have, even some of the minor sports has, when they travel, the training, the conditioning, and everything else is mostly year-round. How do you support that athlete to get through in four years? Do you have programs that let them go five years? Because it's really tough to get the classes and the support you need on the schedule they have to keep. Yeah. Good point. That's even a very non-income sports now. Well, uh, absolutely, Thanks, and that's a very good question. I think our uh, uh, the average student who's not participating in athletics takes five years to graduate. So the the extra demands to compete at this high level, regardless of whether it's football or varsity sport, um, there's a huge time demand on their hands. What we try to do is prepare them, spend more time with time management, um, and and prior to the season on how to manage your time, how to deal with the stress of athletics, the time of athletics, as, as well as uh, competing at a world-class university with students who, don't, who aren't playing and, and putting the time in. And the, but we, they're world-class students. That's exactly right. And, but we have an academic center for all of our student athletes uh, where we support them uh, in, in whatever needs they have. If it's individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring, if it's a, a, a class where we have a number of athletes, we'll have a learning specialist that will, that will uh, prepare them for their tests and, and help them in any way they can. That's, you know, we have a center in the Cole Center, primarily for hockey uh, and both men's and women's basketball. And then our other center, uh, the Fetzer Center, uh, for ac our academic support uh, is in the McLean Center. Another question. Hi, uh, stand up. What's your name? Hi, my name's Sally Minsberg. And I was wondering, as a student here, I feel like the big three sports are 
hockey, football, and basketball. But I was wondering, what sports do you think are the most underrated sports, whether it be something like rowing or cross-country, track? What do Good you think question. are the sports that aren't in the media? Good question. Well, the, the three sports that you mentioned happen to be, they, they raise money so that we can operate 23 sports. You know, football makes the most, then basketball, then hockey. But all three of those generate the, the, the finances so that we can run all the other activities and sports and allow them to compete at a, at, at a national level. I don't think it's fair to say which one is underrated. Every one of them, every one of them work extremely hard to compete at a very, very high level. Uh, we've had a number of them that have won national championships. So uh, I, I, I'd hate to list which one's more important or who uh, is, is unappreciated because uh, I, I know I appreciate all of them because I know how hard all those athletes work. Barry, we're, we're, we're going to kick the break, but okay. I want to find out from you if your attitude towards non-income sports has changed since you've become an AD uh, because I think sometimes the income's coaches feel like they're carrying everybody financially, yeah. but and you don't get a chance to see a lot of those sports when you're active, but let, let's get that when okay. we come back. We'll be right back. We're in Madison. Barry Alvarez, more questions from you guys. Be right back. Hey, we're back in Madison. Barry Alvarez is with us today. Barry, before we go to questions, has your attitude about non-income sports changed it, since it, you became it, an AD? It really hasn't, John. You know, as a high school coach and a father of two, uh, two daughters who played a number of sports, uh, I was friends with every, you know, all the coaches. Yeah. So I was always supportive um, and an observer of all the sports, not just football and basketball, but all of them. So uh, my attitude is been very similar. Right? Good. It hasn't changed. Good. Um, question. Hi, my name is Tom Hager. I'm a Madison student, and I was just wondering, uh, Coach Snyder at Kansas State turned that program around, and they called it the Miracle in Manhattan. Do you feel what you did here was the Miracle in Madison, and you ever, have you ever gotten a chance to talk with Coach Snyder about what, what you and him have both done? I don't know if you know this. Coach Snyder and I were together for eight years at Iowa. We coached on the same staff and are very close friends. So uh, we, we we have stayed in touch. He just got back into coaching after retiring a couple years ago. He's going to go back to Kansas State. But we, he's one of the guys that I would bounce things off of and vice versa. And we both inherited similar situations. I think uh, his may have been worse. His, Kansas State had never won, ever. I think they won six games one year. Uh, but that, that was the best they had ever done. So uh, he, he did a, just a tremendous job there. I agree exactly with what you're talking about. Stand up. What's your name? Uh, Peter Tonys. Peter, what's your question? Uh, Coach Alvarez, uh, just uh, several years ago, uh, I took a business trip to uh, Mason City, Iowa. Had never been there before. And um, got a chance to see the, uh, the basketball team was practicing. Got into the gym area, saw the trophy, uh, the, the, state Iowa, the Iowa State Championship you had won, and uh, saw your name on that trophy, which was pretty cool. Um, and then as I was uh, driving back to my hotel that night, I... Uh, noticed uh, something that seemed just a little bit too coincidental. Uh, directly across the street from the high school there in Mason City, there's a uh, mileage sign. And uh, there's three cities on that sign. And, uh, of course, I noticed Madison, Wisconsin was on that sign. Uh, 200 miles, 250 miles, whatever it is. So my question to you, Coach Alvarez, is uh, back at that time, um, or, or after that time, uh, you know, before uh, Chancellor... Uh, Donna Shalala had offered you the job to come to be the head coach at Wisconsin. Did you ever... Uh, did Madison sign stick in your head? Yeah, did you <laughs> yeah. ever envision that you would uh, come to Wisconsin? You no, know, my last year at, 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 uh, at, at Mason City, I drove to Madison and to watch. Uh, called, I knew Dave McLean. They had recruited some of my players, called and, and spent a couple of days here. But that year I was offered the job at, uh, at Iowa, and it's very difficult make the jump from high school to get a chance uh, to get an offer to go from high school to college, uh, Division I in particular. And that year, Hayden Fry took the Iowa job, the year we won the state championship. And Mason City was much like Wisconsin, hadn't won, uh, had not been very good in football. And uh, our third year there, we won the state championship, and Hayden offered me the job. But I'd visited Dave McLean the year before. Um, we're going to be right back. More questions and stay with us for Madison. <laughs> uh, 
Hi, we're back in Madison. Uh, Barry Alvarez is taking some of our questions. Uh, stand up. What's your question? What's your name? Mel McCartney. Mel, how are you? Good. And my question is, do you think it's realistic to expect to see baseball back at the University of Wisconsin? Ooh. That, I, Thanks, Mel. I, you know, I would have been surprised if we'd gone through this this uh, show with <laughs> Mel's without a short that stop. question. But <laughs> you know what? Um, right now, uh, this is certainly not the time to think uh, of adding other sports. Uh, and baseball, I, I love baseball. Pat Richter, the you know, former athletic director, who made the decision uh, when he had a tough decision to eliminate five sports, played baseball here and, and, and was a very good player. Uh, but that was the right thing to do at the time. Right now is not the time to, to think about adding any sports. So I, I don't see it in the near future. It wouldn't hurt if Madison had like more than three days of spring too, you know. <laughs> uh, hi, what's your question? My name is Ron Luskin. As a coach, your success was predicated on evaluating players and recruiting them. Now that you're an athletic director, your success is probably about uh, evaluating coaches and hiring them. So how would you compare the uh, recruiting of uh, players to what you've learned in your ability to hire good coaches? Good question. Well, yeah, it is a good question, and I hope I don't have to hire too many. <laughs> <laughs> that, that means people are having some problems. But, um, you know, as in, as in evaluating an athlete, you know what you want. You have to find someone that's a fit. That's the one thing, you know, someone that has had success wherever they've been, but someone that I think will fit into this university, the beliefs of the university, Someone that our fans and this community will accept. And, someone, and it has to be the right type of person. And I think I know what, what our people want. But it has to fit that personality. It's not just someone that's out there that's won a lot of games and been successful at a specific school. It's going to have to be the right fit for this university. Barry, what do you say to the notion that some people say Wisconsin Will uh, is now competitive in the two major income sports, actually three now at Wisconsin, hockey, basketball, and football, but that we'll never win a national championship because of the academic standards. Do you think there's, uh, is that a fair claim? No, I, I don't think that's fair. And and I'm sure I, you've because, heard it. Well, yeah. Well, I, I've never heard it because of academics. I've heard it for a lot of other reasons. Yeah. You could throw academics in there, but uh, we've been close. You know, uh, in 93, that first Rose Bowl year, um, I had to make a tough decision uh, and not allow Bill Callahan to go to our Minnesota game. That's the only game we lost. I'm not too sure we, w we don't win that game if he's there. That was the only game we lost that year. We would have been national champs. We, we would have been the only undefeated team in the country. Mm -hmm. Now with the playoffs, um, you know, we're 12-1 tw and one in our league a f just a couple years ago. Yep. So if you can win our league, you can go undefeated in our league, that'll put you in a championship sure. So game. if Ohio State could win a national championship, Wisconsin Absolutely. Um, the scheduling issue. Um, you know, every major college program is hearing this. There are a lot of D1A or D2A schools on the schedule, yet ticket prices go up. Um, you know, in the old days, the Wisconsin played you, Nebraska, you know, to tune up for the, the, yeah. the, the Big Ten schedule. Can you explain why this schedule is happening? It's not just at Wisconsin. It's everywhere. Well, it, it's everywhere, and it's with, 12 game, with a 12-game schedule, you have to be careful that you don't beat yourself up in four non-conference games <clears throat> and then go into our league minus some players. You know, you, you want to play a competitive schedule. You want to be fair to your fans, yet you want to be fair to your football team because the first goal is to win a champion, win the league championship. Um, so... I think what, what most people try to do, if you have a, a BCS school, uh, you, you play some schools like a Mac school or, or, or someone in that category. Uh, I used to play, like to play a BCS school, uh, a school that if you played well, uh, you should beat. Mm -hmm. And then a couple schools, you know, right. somebody that you should, that you're going to beat. Okay. Um, we'll talk more about this. We're going to show a piece of film on the way out to break. You do many things well, some things you don't do so well. Here's Barry Alvarez singing at Wrigley Field. <laughs> a one, a two, a three. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care about everything. 
This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Hey, we're back in Madison. Barry Alvarez is our guest. We've talked about scheduling. We've talked about Brett. We talked about the, the glory years. Let's talk about the future. You're the AD. You sit up, um, you know, in, in, the, in the big seats during the games. You are the master of all you survey. What's, what's the, the, the terrain of Wisconsin athletics going to look like 10, 15 years from now? Well, Media, players. You, you know, a, a couple things concern me. Economics, naturally, today, uh, that's our hot topic. And I just came from four days of meetings, two with just athletic directors and two in Big Ten meetings with faculty reps and, and uh, uh, women's administrators talking about cost-cutting, uh, cost-containment issues. Uh, we're going to have to change uh, a lot of things in college athletics. I'm, I'm talking about how we travel. Big changes? How many, yeah, big changes. We're going to have to because uh, with, with prices escalating as they have been um, and the economy as it is, uh, we, we have to make changes, and it's real. It, this is something that's not going away. And you away. started already, right? We started. You know what? We, we were very proactive in going into this year. I met with... Uh, our people met with, with every head of every department uh, in the athletic department. We, at, we brainstormed. I, I think actually we did it last spring. And we talked about ways that we can make more money and ways that we can trim in each department. And, and had a little uh, exercise in that. Our people came up with answers. We saved, we've saved over a million dollars just from that exercise alone. Um, what about media? Um, and uh, big-time college athletics, that's been a big source of revenue. Media is changing radically. Newspapers are going away. Television's becoming more fragmented. Um, I see a time in the very near future where you can pay 10 bucks and watch the Badger games on your computer. Yeah. Do you see that happening? See, and we're on the Big Ten Network right I, I, now, which that's is right. actually I, a manifestation of a different... I, I think, I, I think that's, that's very quick. I mean, you can see some of that right now. Right. I mean, we're... Uh, we're sending out wrestling matches and uh, over that media right now. Right. And I think, you know, the Big Ten Network and, and being aggressive as we were and putting the Big, Big Ten Network and, and getting the distri distribution uh, nationally. You know, I think we're, we're, there are 70 million homes where it's available today. Right. And, and almost 40 million that have it right. currently. That's just our league. So I, I think... Uh, now you see the Southeast Southeast Conference going to have their it's going to have their own uh, TV network. Mm -hmm. I think one of the conferences out west has has theirs. So I think uh, you know I think the sky's the limit. I think it's going to continue to grow. I think you'll be able to see eventually you'll see be able to see every game that you want to see on your computer. Uh, got about thirty seconds. Very easy question. How long are you going to remain AD, and are you ever going to coach again? I, I won't coach again. Um, you know, I, I had my time. I had my run. You had a good run. I had, I had a very good run. And I, you know what? I had a plan. I, I always idolized Bob Devaney. wanted to do what he did and follow his, his path. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, I like the director's job. I like the coaches I have. Um, and I like the challenge. It's a new challenge. And uh, I've enjoyed it. Good. Hey, Bear, thanks. Okay, hey, John. Congratulations on a great run. Stay here. Uh, everybody, thanks for joining us in Madison on Wisconsin. See ya. The preceding program was produced by the University of Wisconsin in association with the Big Ten Network.